Dakota with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today, another exciting episode for you. And what we're going to do today for you guys, I actually show you guys what I'm growing in my garden this winter time. So we're probably like near the tail end of winter. We're almost getting into spring, but we're not quite there yet. Some of the days have actually been quite nice here. You know, high 70s lately. We've been having a warm spell, so it's really refreshing to be out in my garden every day and work, and uh, you know, get things going for the spring and summertime garden. But the bad news is because it's been heating up a little bit, uh, you know, sooner than normal and expected. My, some of my plants are freaking out, uh, you know, because it's getting warmer. So they're actually, uh, you know, going to flower and seed. So I'm having to use them a little bit quicker. Now, before we actually go down on the ground, I want to let you guys know, no matter where you live, you guys could grow a garden. I mean, I'm here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Most of my neighbors around me basically have rock landscaping. You could kind of see one over the fence on that side. But my backyard's a bit different. You know, it just has all greenery and all edible things you could eat. Like, we all need to eat each and every day. Like, most of us eat three meals a day. Some of you guys maybe even eat more. <laughs> and why not have some of the food, at least some of the food you eat, you know, come from your own hands, from your own creation, come from, from nature and your space. Instead of growing rocks or weeds or grass that's not being used, except if you got dogs or maybe kids, why not grow some food so you could lower your food bill? But more importantly, and the reason why I grow food myself, is to have higher quality food than money can buy. You know, our food system is in such a sad state right now because the food that's being produced is super cheap and I like super cheap food, but the problem is they're cutting corners because all they're after is basically making profit. And they don't care how nutritious the food is. That being said, fruits and vegetables are the most nutritious food you guys could be buying, purchasing, and shopping, and buying if you do that. And I buy plenty of fruits and vegetables from the store of the ones that I don't grow. But if I grow it in my backyard, I'm definitely not going to be buying it. So anyways, with that, let's go ahead and head down to my backyard garden and show you guys what I grew this winter and what you guys could grow in the winter time if you live in a mild climate like me. So now I'm on the ground in the garden and I'm gonna go ahead and go over what I grew this winter bed by bed. Now, we're finally coming out of winter here and I know some of you guys, it's still quite cold where you're at, but I'm actually getting ready for my summer planting quite soon. And anyways, uh, let's go ahead and go over the beds. This bed here, we had copious amounts and still have copious amounts of leafy greens, including things like uh, cauliflower and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. And uh, the best performing one in the bed was the uh, Red Russian Kale uh, for the winter time. These guys are growing amazingly. And maybe at the end of this episode, I'll show you guys actually what I've been doing with my greens. Like almost every night, I'll harvest a big basket of greens. I'll take them inside and process them so that I could eat them later in the season when they go out. Uh, over on this bed, we got a whole bit of bok choy. Uh, bok choy is probably tonight's project. I'm going to go ahead and uh, harvest all the flowering tops plus some of the bok choy. Uh, probably turn that into the sauerkraut. I also interplanted this bed with some leeks that I'll probably uh, transplant uh, when this bed comes out because as soon as I harvest all the bok choy out of here, we're going to go ahead and switch over to summer here. Let's see, I have all these little planters in between my beds. And I have uh, just dandelions that were growing up as weeds, and I just planted them in here so they could grow. So I have a nice, uh, abundant amount of uh, wild dandelion greens any time of year. These next two beds here, I got a bunch of spinach, which is now going to flower. Uh, the spinach is a slow grower, so I've finally been able to harvest it. Now it's at a good point, and so I'm probably going to make a, maybe a spinach lettuce salad tonight. And pretty soon that's actually going to get uh, pulled out and then replanted for summer too. And then over on this side, uh, same story, we got arugula. So arugula is probably the number one vegetable, you know, if you got high blood pressure and clogged arteries and stuff. Uh, so that's why I grow it, plus I really like the flavor. I have at least three different varieties of arugula in here, including a standard uh, large leaf that's going to flower here. And uh, these were more mature when I planted them. And then we have this guy, the one in the middle, uh, with the white flowers and their small flowers compared to these flowers on this guy. I've kind of put them together. You guys could see. Uh, the flowers are actually some of my favorite parts to eat on the arugula. Oops. <laughs> Tastes like barbecue sauce. And then I got the, this other variety of arugula here that's a lot smaller. And they're not bolting as quickly because they were a lot uh, younger when I planted them out. So I'll still be able to harvest that 
I've been coming in and basically topping these guys back and uh, using them for uh, making juices and whatnot <clears throat> and uh, still harvesting the nice large leaves. Let's uh, come down on the next two beds here. So these next two beds, we got some tot soy that's seen its better days and some uh, flowering uh, kale in the middle. I've let all these guys go to flower. Um, the bees love them as you guys see all the activity. Actually right now I'm seeing a lot of, uh, of the native pollinator bees, uh, maybe solitary bees, not the standard honeybees uh, this time of the uh, day. And this was the tot soy, so I harvested it a lot when it was small and juiced it. And right when it sh shot out the first time and started going to flower, I chopped all the tops off and then fermented those. And then over in this bed, we have another greens bed, including the uh, red Russian kale. We got some cabbage, got some uh, broccoli, cauliflower, and uh, we got some nice uh, dinosaur kale here. Moving on back to the next bed. Uh, this bed has my Egyptian walking onions. So these guys really uh, got thinned out uh, during the winter time. They were pretty much just like nothing there. But now that the weather's warmed up a little bit, they're totally back. And I come and almost every night I harvest a couple of these uh, green onion tops to put up in my salads. Uh, the green onion tops are much more nutritious than the onion bulbs that are normally grown. So I like to use these uh, year round. And because these are the Egyptian walking onions, they are perennial onions. So they grow year round, so that's really nice. And then over on that side, I think I have some clumping kind of onions. Over on this side, we have uh, one of my tree collared crosses. So this is a tree collared cross with an ornamental kale, in my opinion. And uh, they just want the flower, start sprouted seed, and it's making these nice broccoli like uh, flowering tips. I'm going to let it go to seed. And this bed is just like a mixture of uh, mostly perennials. We got some ruin here, hot and spicy oregano. We got some uh, chives in here. We got some uh, uh, lots of parsley here. This is the one I like to grow my parsley in because it's a uh, parsley like perennial. And you got some Swiss chard in here, and got some uh, fennel also uh, growing in here, as well as some uh, rosemary. To go ahead and uh, continue on the tour. The next two beds we got, this is my bed of lettuce that I've actually been harvesting from. That's why it's not looking totally full. It's actually uh, bolting because the weather's getting a bit warmer. Probably also, I'm probably underwatering at this point, so it's a little bit stressed out. Uh, this is the first bed of lettuce that I planted, I think, like in October or November. So October, November, December, January, February, March. I've been harvesting this stuff for like uh, four months now and now I'm, I'm probably gonna get the final harvest here in the next couple days and then it's gonna get replanted for summer over on this side different story we got some uh, leeks and uh, leeks are probably one of the most nutritious uh, allium family uh, plants so I have a lot of leeks intermixed in and these guys are uh, sugar beets so these are the beets that they use to make the sugar out of so I'm gonna uh, grow those and they're heirlooms see how they see what happens and then I got some uh, celery planted right in the middle. This next bed here, we have mostly the uh, Swiss chard. And check out my shirt. See my shirt? It says, it's chard being this awesome. <laughs> I like this shirt. But I like the shard too. But yeah, this one has a chard. And the chard is pretty much a perennial a green here. It'll last for like over a year easily. So I'll be eating this Swiss chard here. You'll see all summer long, even through the heat. In addition, I've interplanted besides the chard with onions. So these are onions grown for the bulb, uh, mostly sweet varieties. Um, I could also harvest the tops if I'd like. Once again, another planter with the wild dandelions. So if you go to buy dandelions in the store, you're getting chicory. You know, uh, these are the wild ones, so the leaves are not quite as big. And these are like really good for you. I mean, I want to encourage everybody to eat some dandelions. And not only are the greens edible, also the roots are edible, as well as the uh, flowers are edible too. Uh, this bed here, we have a whole bed of onions. And this year I did something a little bit different with the onions. So like last year, for those of you guys that are long-term viewers, I had onion, you know, bulbs that I saved to eat and they sprouted. And I planted those last year, you know, mostly. And this year's harvest of onions was not that particularly good. Like the bulbs weren't that large and they just 
I mean, they produced, but they didn't really produce well. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna not really replant my sprouting onions, although you could do that. It makes lots of greens, which is nice. So this year I tried something different. Uh, all these onions are from uh, basically transplants or from starts from like six packs over in this bed. And then the next bed over, those were started from onion sets that I bought. So of course, you know, the ones from the transplants were larger when I planted them and the ones from the sets were smaller, but they're both doing really good. Let's see this next bed here. This is my bed of the dinosaur kale that's been growing like over a year at this point. It is now finally going to flower, although it's still also shooting out a lot of leaves. So uh, this has provided me food pretty much for the full year. And now I think this is pretty much uh, coming to an end. But yeah, these are quite uh, beautiful. Now I want to encourage you guys, you know, when they're going to flower, you could let them go to flower and save your seeds, which I do encourage you guys to do. But you could also just break these guys off, you know, and eat these. I mean, it's just pretty much like broccoli. Hmm. You want to get them at the young stage? They're definitely more tender and delicious. So these next two beds, as I said, this one has all the uh, onions from sets. And then this bed here has my uh, goji berry plant. Also some um, ha or Chinese chives and some tree collards. This had all kind of um, mint and things in the bottom. And I totally just uh, refilled this bed, topped it off. It took probably like a good three inches to top it off, so I'm going to plant new stuff for the season because it was kind of going wild. I'm sure some of the uh, mint will actually come back because I left a lot of the roots down below, so I'll have basically endless mint. Let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, two beds over here. So these next two beds here and here <laughs> have, uh, this one has basically a parsley planted in the middle and the outer rings are all uh, the Italian flat leaf parsley. And uh, you know, they are related. So they're pretty similar, but if you look closely, you could tell how they're different. The celery basically kind of starting to get the ribbing like they do, and then the uh, parsley on the outside does not really get that. They have more like a roundish stems. I really like the parsley. I mean, the parsley is really good. Like if you're walking by barbecues and people are like barbecuing their meat or somebody's smoking, that's carcinogenic, you know, that smoke. So you don't want to breathe that. But if you do breathe that, Eat some extra parsley because that'll actually detox you. Also, parsley is also anti-tumor. And I think that more people need to eat parsley. Just two nights ago, actually, I made a meal of just harvesting like a couple leaves from all my parsley and made a big salad with uh, just parsley leaves finely chopped up with uh, sprouted buckwheat that I grew myself, some mashed up avocados, and some garlic. Over on this side, we have all of my Apollo Napa cabbage. Uh, it's starting to flower. I went. I came in last night. If you look, I chopped off all the flowering tops, so I have a lot of the green bottoms. I use all the flowering tops to make some uh, some kimchi that's actually fermenting inside. Maybe I'll show you guys at the end of this episode. I'm gonna go ahead and probably uh, come out here and just end up harvest the plants now and use those for more kimchi or some uh, dehydrated, uh, you know, uh, kale-like chips, or in this case, cabbage chips. Uh, let's see here, next bed right here, this is a perennial bed, and this has some uh, celery grown from last year, some onions from last year, and also my uh, tree collards uh, growing above. <clears throat> this next bed over here is my big bag bed. It's a fabric pot. Now, because this thing like folds over, I haven't really topped this off in a while, so it's kind of, the, the soil level is getting kind of low, and I pretty much ignore it, because this is, to me now, now this bed's a pain in the butt, so I don't really do anything with it. And I planted out originally herbs in here. This rosemary is doing beautifully. I have rosemary any time of the year. Also have uh, things like the uh, bee balm growing down here and some uh, garlic chives. And also I got some sage and of course my green tree collard and I got some uh, purple tree collards in this bed as well. All right, so this last bed here has more parsley in it. I really love parsley, and I love the fact that parsley grows really well in the desert. It'll pretty much last an entire year, and I'll have parsley to eat the whole summer, and it handles the weather, whether the summer or the winter, quite well. Different story with cilantro. If you planted cilantro, you'd probably have it for a little bit longer because it's getting too hot. It's gonna bolt really fast. But a good one to plant in place of cilantro is the papalo, which I like a lot. Anyways, all my parsley's doing quite well. I harvested a bunch just a few nights ago, as I had mentioned. So you guys just saw the side of my yard that has the round circular four foot 
raised beds. These were all purchased at Walmart for like $10 each. And they've held up all right. A couple have busted and I've had to tape up some of the sides because the plastic gets really brittle. So you don't want to lean on them at all. Would I do that side again? You know, I did basically the circular raised beds with drip irrigation. You know, knowing what I know now, I would probably do it in concrete blocks and do it exactly as I did it this side. This side works a lot better. Um, it conserves more water and I actually also have better soil on this side. So I usually get better growth on this side in addition. So uh, this side I have the concrete blocks and I have videos on how I made this as well as the irrigation that I put in here. On the irrigation, you guys aren't seeing any irrigation on top. And I have the <clears throat> Aqua Jet subsoil irrigation system uh, underneath, uh, about four inches underneath the soil line that basically comes out with high pressure and shoots water uh, to give the plants the water where they need it at the roots. Furthermore, it also aerates the root zones to keep my microbes happy. So uh, next, let's go ahead and turn you guys around this side of the yard. Um, I got it mostly planted out, but some of the stuff I didn't even get planted out because I've been so busy. So this is my first bed. It's kind of under the shade of the house, and I got a couple of different things. I planted uh, green tree collards from cuttings. I just put some, uh, literally some sticks in the ground, and then they came up. And then uh, mostly in this bed, I just got it cleared from the summer crop. And I have um, things like my ashitaba that went to seed and some dinosaur kale. And then I got this guy coming up, which actually, I forget what it is now. There's probably some tag. But uh, let me know if one of you guys recognize what this is. We'll do a close-up because <laughs> I forget, man. I think it's some kind of like Asian longevity leafy green. Tastes a little bit bitter. I know, I think it's an Asian medicinal green. But it's done really well, and I have a lot of it. <laughs> now, on my trellis uh, wall here, where I normally grow cucumbers in the summertime, in the wintertime, I'm growing uh, sugar snap peas, or that's what they were labeled, actually, when I bought them. And I think they're filling out quite nicely. They may be snow peas. I don't know. These look pretty flat to me. But whatever they are, I got a bunch of peas uh, going up my trellis. All right, so in this four foot by eight foot uh, bed here, I have a bunch of uh, cauliflower and broccoli and ornamental kale that's actually uh, going to flower and seed. They also have massive amounts of uh, aphids I'm seeing, so I'm just probably gonna come in and cut them off and get rid of them. In addition, in the middle here, I planted some spinach. So unlike the spinach on the other side that is bolting, the spinach is actually doing quite well still. And then I have some of my hybrid um, tree collards slash ornamental kales uh, planted along the back row here. Uh, this bed, for some reason, has been really infested with the aphids. And so I've been coming out with uh, high pressure water with my bug blaster and kind of like soaking them every day. And I think I'm going to even come back with some uh, neem oil and Dr. Bronner's and hit this stuff because man it's it's pretty out of control and especially when you have a bug situation you want to get them under control I probably need to spend more time with this bed because I haven't been and you know it's a constant battle with them and I don't want them to spread to other parts of my garden because actually the other side is actually not really affected all right let's go ahead and move on to this next uh, bed over here so this four foot by eight foot bed once again has more greens and pretty much the similar greens as planted on the other side, including the uh, red Russian kale, also some uh, Brussels sprouts, and uh, I think I got some cabbage in here, some Swiss chard as well. It's all doing pretty good. It's a late planting. And then this next bit here, doing really well, we've got a lot of different lettuce. So I think I got over like 60 heads of lettuce in here. And you guys will notice they're at different stages because I lost a couple plants and then I've had to replant some smaller ones. So this is good. This is like staggering my planting because if all 60 heads were ready at the same time, I wouldn't be able to eat them. And how I normally like to harvest the lettuces is I don't just cut down a whole head like when you go to the store and you buy a head of lettuce. I actually just come and just break off like a couple leaves off each of the large plants. And if I do that off, you know, 50 plants in here, then I'll have enough for salad and the plants could continue to grow. Now I only do this until they start to go uh, to set seeds. So once they start sending up a, sh a shoot and they get taller, 
then I'll basically just chop it down and then harvest the whole head, you know, before it goes to flower too much because then it starts to get a little bit bitter. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much this bed right here. So this last bed here, I basically didn't have time or didn't have the plants or partly both to plant it out uh, for the winter. So basically my dog's been using it to go to the bathroom in. <laughs> so I've been picking that up all the time and uh, soon enough I'll actually be prepping this bed, topping it off with new compost and uh, getting it growing for the summer season, which I'll probably start planting out in just a couple weeks here. Now, it's always best to kind of keep something growing in the beds whenever possible. I just harvested or uh, took out all the roots, all the leftover decaying roots that were in this bed so I could plant my new crop. But there are a lot of earthworms already breaking down those roots, but I really like to keep the beds with something growing in it year round. Unfortunately, that just didn't happen with my busy schedule and not having enough plants to do that. Also over the winter, one of my favorite places to grow is actually my greenhouses, which I have two of them. Over on this side, I have all kinds of tree collards in like five gallon pots. And then over on this side, I have one gallon pots all on irrigation. You know, I got a couple peppers in here, ashitaba, uh, more tree collards, some pineapple, a date palm. And also got some uh, Janeiro Procum bins over on this side. So I close this up during the winter. The main issue I have with that when I close it up is that to keep it warm, I'm not getting enough air circulation. So it gets quite humid in there. And then I had some issues with some uh, fungus diseases because it was too humid. So now that it's uh, warming up, I've actually opened them up to kind of get some airflow through here. Uh, let's go ahead and spin around to the other greenhouse um, right behind the camera person. So in this greenhouse, uh, which is also holding up quite well, uh, I have a lot of the different starts. So I have a whole couple of trays of uh, tree collared starts that actually I dug up out of the ground and transplanted into six packs and four inch pots. I also have some onions I need to plant out. I started some potatoes that were sprouting. And then over on this side, we have a lot of the uh, tree collard, some peppers, a lot of cuttings from my tree collards. I got some onions, got some aloe vera over here, and then I got more of the Genera Procumbens in the five gallon pots uh, down near the end. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm growing this year uh, over the winter time. I think the next thing I want to do is actually take you guys in real quick and show you guys just maybe three ways I've been using the copious amounts of leafy greens that I've been growing in my garden. Because You're probably saying to yourself, John, how do you eat all those leafy greens? Well, trust me, I eat as many as I can. Barely any of them actually get to go into the compost because I'm uh, getting them into me, which is the reason why I grow them. And if you are growing leafy greens, I want you guys to get the leafy greens into you. So actually, let's go ahead and head into my kitchen and show you guys how I'm using my leafy greens so that they could get into me and benefit me and my health. So now we're inside the kitchen and I'm going to show you guys the three ways I've been using the copious amounts of leafy greens I'm growing in my garden. Uh, number one is the juicer. So I've been juicing greens almost every day now. I usually use my juicer maybe once or twice a day. For example, this morning for breakfast, I juice like four pomegranates that I de-seeded, juiced the pomegranate aerials with one pineapple, made approximately 55 ounces of juice. That was delicious and super nutritious. Then for uh, lunch, I had another juice with greens from my garden, including lettuce and bok choy, also some carrots and celery one apple, a cucumber, and that made probably like another 55 ounces of juice. I only was able to drink uh, 32 ounces of that. Oh, I also use beet greens in there. Drink about 32 ounces of that, have about 16 ounces for later. So that really like goes through a lot of produce and just basically turns one pound of produce into one cup of juice on average. And then the next way is we've been making uh, sauerkraut and fermenting vegetables. So this preserves your vegetables till later, especially now that I have some of my uh, brassica family plants uh, going to flower, I basically topped off all the Apollo Napa cabbage before the flowers got too big when they're still pretty small. And I chopped them up and I put them in these little jars here. So this is how I'm fermenting my vegetables. Basically I got a big colander full, I washed them, I cut them all up, I uh, salted them, I put seasonings in there including uh, onions from my garden and some garlic and I put some carrots on top. We mash that in, the salt helps to uh, pull out some of the moisture, and then I made a brine solution, like a 3% uh, salt water brine solution, put them in here, and put them in one of these uh, jars, or these, uh, yeah, jars, 
with this uh, rubber seal. So the cool thing I like about this jar is because I'm not using a standard traditional airlock like I have used in the past. This is a new way I'm uh, experimenting with. Uh, because this has basically a, a, a clasp on it, it holds pressure down. There's also a rubber gasket which keeps it airtight. But when the pressure gets too much, this gasket basically lets some of the, uh, some of the extra uh, water or the extra gas uh, like the CO2 produced by the fermentation process escape. So that's why I have it in these little uh, containers here so when they do uh, leak out some of the liquid it goes in the container instead of all over the countertop. So that's the standard um, uh, kraut over there. We also have some uh, standard sauerkraut, more traditional over there. And then we have uh, my kimchi. So this one actually has the pepper powder, hot pepper powder from my garden and uh, you know pretty much the same things that were in the other one and so I'm really looking forward to this now the cool thing about fermentation is that you are maximizing the nutrition from the foods you're producing unlike when you heat your food you know cook it at high temperature to make kale chips um, or other things this way you're keeping it raw so you're not heating it and when you heat food you basically uh, lose uh, all the enzymes and you degrade the nutrition. So in this case, you know, the probiotics or lactobacillus bacteria are actually uh, digesting some of the sugars in the food and actually making additional vitamins that you'll now get to enjoy. Plus, furthermore, this is a really excellent way uh, to preserve your food because once it's fermented, you know, this will keep for literally years in the fridge, although it's not going to last that long here because I'll probably eat it within the next few months. I mean, I like to put a hand uh, a handful or a forkful or two uh, in my uh, blended salad dressing that I make every night and yes salads another big way that I've been using my leafy greens almost every night I make salads and I make fresh soups uh, from my leafy greens next let's go ahead and show you guys the last way I really like to use my leafy greens even more than just uh, fermenting them so the last way I like to use the leafy greens from my garden in the winter is to preserve them uh, for later use especially when I travel so I could eat some of the homegrown food that I grew when I'm on the airplane or when I travel and plus this stuff will keep also for a year plus although it definitely is not going to last that long here in my house and so what I've been using is I've been using my dehydrator to dehydrate at low temperature uh, my leafy greens to make kale chips or collard chips or tot soy chips or bok choy chips or even you can make lettuce chips, right? How this works is I basically take take a bowl full, huge uh, colander full of greens, wash them, chop them up, put them in a nice large serving bowl, and uh, blend up in the blender some uh, bell pepper with some nuts and some maybe some miso, some sauerkraut, and some herbs and spices. Blend that up, and then I'll pour the salad dressing all into the greens. I'll mix them up, and then I'll take the greens and then put them in the dehydrator to dehydrate and it just basically removes the moisture keeps the maximum amount of enzymes and nutrients because we are doing this at a low temperature 105 degrees is what my Excalibur is set at and it could go above maybe 10 degrees that it fluctuates 10 above and 10 below the temperature you set so it doesn't get any hotter than 115 and this is what we end up with inside I use this um, <clears throat> non-stick parchment paper uh, because otherwise the uh, collard chips would get my stainless steel trays really dirty and they'd be this is a pain in the butt to clean so on this on the uh, parchment paper once they're done you could basically just uh, peel these off easily and now you have a dehydrated kale chips now I don't know if you guys priced dehydrated kale chips in the store lately at the health food store or you know those gourmet fruit fruit shops you know they're kind of getting into more places even Walmart nowadays is selling kale chips believe it or not but they're like $5.99 for two ounces. Yes, I said it, two ounces. Is that more expensive than some stuff, some other herbs that you might smoke? I don't know, it's getting really pricey. But anyways, you could. I have all the unlimited greens I want. I mix up some stuff and then you could uh, eat this. Mmm. Nice and crunchy. And now that these are dehydrated, they'll store easily a year. But this is not gonna even last till my next trip which is coming up in a few days. I'm gonna just take uh, all these greens with me so I can eat a few of my greens every day when I'm traveling. This happens to be a curry 
a style with uh, curry seasoning, it's super delicious. So I have a, uh, I think this is like um, ones made from kale on the top, and then on the bottom, I have ones made from uh, the bok choy, and I think this is maybe more of a Mexican seasoning. But man, these come out so good. I'll be sure to check a, a link down below this video to a link where I show you actually guys how to make kale chips. Super simple, super easy. And if you guys are looking for a dehydrator, I would encourage you guys to visit my website where I actually sell dehydrators um, at discountjuicers.com. Your purchase at Discount Juicers uh, helps support me so I can continue to make uh, these gardening videos for you guys. But yeah, I mean, I really want to encourage you guys to grow year-round if you're able. And even if you live in the snow, you guys could grow sprouts and microgreens indoors in the winter. Or if you erect a, a hoop house or double hoop house, you know, even outside when it's snowing, you could still grow inside the hoop house some more cold tolerant crops so you could have greens year round because you know as the name of my channel growing your greens I want you guys to grow and eat your greens in copious amounts because the fact of the matter is clear most Americans simply do not eat enough leafy greens and leafy greens are the most nutritious food on the entire planet with the most amount of phytonutrients and phytochemicals that have been shown to be disease protective with the least amount of calories most Americans are eating standard fast foods and junk foods animal foods in excess that are high in calories and low in nutrients and that's in my opinion why many people are getting sick these days because they're simply not eating enough greens so hopefully this video has motivated you guys to let you guys know that you can grow your greens wherever you live and that you guys should start including more of them in your diet if you guys enjoy this episode hey please give me a thumbs up to let me know I'll do more episodes maybe with how I make some of these uh, foods in particular because I've just explained the process uh, to you guys also be sure to click that subscribe button right down below to be notified my new and upcoming episodes I have coming out about every three uh, to four days and be sure to check my past episodes I have over 1100 episodes maybe even 1200 now uh, you know explaining you guys all aspects of how you guys could grow your own food at home as well as going and visiting other places and touring other farms and people's homes and urban homesteads to show you guys what they're doing so you guys can get ideas uh, to grow your own food at home because that is you know the way to get the highest quality food is to simply uh, do it yourself so uh, once again my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com we'll see you next time and until then remember keep on growing all right this is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com today I have another exciting episode for you and where I'm at today is probably the last farm that I'll be visiting on my on this trip to Miami area I actually head out of town back home tomorrow so I'll be glad to